All right, good morning, everyone. Today, we're gonna be talking about JavaScript and Jest. Now, there's a lot of topics that we're gonna be covering today. So you're gonna feel like this lesson's a little fast. Um, at the same time, we've already done all of our pre-work in JavaScript. And the only real new concept that we'll be touching today will be Jest. Everything else should be a refresher, but if, any, if at any point you feel like any of these topics are not a refresher, please feel free to let me know. We can always slow down and cover, cover one of these topics more in depth. All right, so the first topic that we're gonna cover today is gonna be, well, what is the internet and how does it work? You're gonna see a version of this diagram multiple times um, throughout this program. And uh, basically, let's just kind of break it down. So I like to use this website called Tieldra um, to kind of give graphical demonstrations. You'll see Adam use something like Scaladra. Um, but the point is that we're just going to use this kind of as a whiteboard, right? And um, so, for example, let's start, let's say we go to something like a social media like Facebook or Instagram, right? So let's say this is my phone and it's displaying Instagram. All right, so phone and in my phone, I'm displaying Instagram. Okay, so what's rendering on my phone is not actually connected to the internet. What this would be referenced to would be the front end side of an application, right? Which is something that you download onto your individual phone. And then whenever your, your phone runs that application, it starts displaying a user interface, which are all the buttons and things that we see here, right? For example, this is a user interface. Um, it's talking to some sort of backend server to be able to grab information or save my data. Um, but essentially, this current website that I'm on or what we see on the screen is our user interface, right? So I get on my phone, I open up my Instagram application, and that front end starts running. Now, that front end is typically built with a combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the web. On the actual phone, it's built with other frameworks, but we're not, we're not going to talk about that, right? So now we, we get my HTML and CSS running. We start seeing things start loading up on my screen. And then JavaScript starts doing its communication process. So what does JavaScript actually do? Well, here, JavaScript, whenever it starts loading, will make requests to a server to grab information from the database and display that information by manipulating the DOM. Now, I don't expect any of you to fully understand what exactly this sentence means. Again, this is just an introduction to how the internet works. We'll understand this more in depth later on as we move on in the program. But know that whenever you open up that application, your JavaScript will attempt to send a request to some sort of server and try to get information so that it can display it for you, right? So, you know, when you have really bad internet connection, you go to open up Facebook or Instagram and you have that spinning wheel, right? Well, that spinning wheel is displaying while that request is completed. So JavaScript sends that request. All right. So that request goes, goes away. And the next thing it does is it interacts with a server. Now, there's many other languages that you can use to build a server, but in the case of uh, what we're doing for this program, we're gonna be utilizing Django, which is gonna be Python mainly, right? So we'll just bring that over here. And then we'll say, that it's going to talk to our Django. And then we'll just call this views. And we'll go over what a Django view actually is later on once we're touching Django. Um, but for now, know that a server has specific functions that it's supposed to react to whenever it receives a request. All right. So when I go to a specific URL up here, so for example, let's say I'm on Instagram, but I want to see my friends, right? Well, then my URL may change to https uh, instagram.com slash friends, right? Well, this slash friends at the end is what's going to tell Django, hey, at the endpoint of friends, you need to trigger a specific behavior, right? So then at this point, 
um, the server will recognize the endpoint and conduct a specific behavior. Now that behavior may differ depending on the endpoint, right? Because as we know, we can like a picture, we can um, block users, we can add users, we can accept information, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things are different functions that are happening in our backend server, right? The requests are being sent to different URL endpoints that will trigger that specific behavior. Now, once that behavior is completed, your server may or may not, depending on what it is that you need it to do, talk with the database. Let me move this a little bit. Which in this case, we'll be utilizing Postgres. All right, and then our database is quite simply just a place where we can put as much data as we need to. We can give identifiers, we can query the database to grab individual information, and then you know manipulate that information as needed. So it goes, again, you open up Instagram, that circle starts spinning. Let's say you're getting your initial feed. So it sends the request for the initial feed. The server receives the request and it says, oh, okay, you wanna see all of the pictures from all the people you're following. Um, let's say it's not going to return all of them at once. It may return like the first 50 or 25. And then as you scroll down, you'll get more, right? So it gets that request. It then talks to the database and it says, hey, I want you to grab all the pictures from coordinating to this ID for this user, because that means that this user is following them. Great. So then the database returns that picture to the server. And then the server then returns that information to JavaScript. And then at that point, JavaScript is what actually makes the pictures show up on your phone. All right, so now we start seeing a couple of, couple of pictures, or post, whatever we want to call them. And that's kind of the way of the full stack application, how the internet actually works, right? Every time you open up an application, the application itself, which is the front end, is individual to the device. But the server is not individual. That server exists on the cloud. There should only, there's going to be multiple servers realistically, uh, but they're all related or kind of mirroring each other. They're just exact copies of one another. And they all talk to one specific database. And that one database talks to all the servers to make sure that everyone's getting the same information. Does anyone have any questions over that? Okay, no questions. Let's keep moving forward. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is Node. Well, as we all know, we've used JavaScript with Webplit, and JavaScript works really well for writing code, but there's a couple of other things that we can do with JavaScript. So although JavaScript is good for front-end development and just writing specific scripts for a specific program, they also built an entire framework called Node.js, and Node.js can be used as a backend framework. We're not going to talk too much about that. I just want everyone to know that that is also a capability of JavaScript. Right? You don't have to write your backend framework in Python. You could also write it in C Sharp, JavaScript. There's other languages that can handle that. But let's talk about Node. What can I do with Node? Well, I can just type in Node into my terminal. When I type in Node into my terminal, and let me zoom in just to make sure everyone can see this. When I type in Node into my terminal, we see that it kind of turns into, into a script here, right? I can do something like console.log and it tells me that I'm triggering a function and say, hello, Victor. All right, we can see that hello, Victor shows up there, but then I get this undefined. Can anyone take a guess at why I'm receiving an undefined after my console.log statement? Is it because you're not like returning anything? 
yeah, the, my program isn't returning anything, right? I'm triggering a function, which is console.log, but that's not actually having a return statement. Whereas if let's say I do three plus three, but when I run that, it automatically returns six because it knows that I'm trying to do a math operation, right? And I don't get that undefined. I can write as much JavaScript code as I want here in this, in this specific editor of Node, um, but it's never going to be saved. It's just going to be living in this temporary space. And then once I go to kill it, it's all going to go away. Now, a good use for this would be for experimenting. Let's say you have a set of code and you want to try to change it around a little bit to see if you can make it more efficient. You could do it in here. That way you're not actually manipulating your own code and you won't mess it up. Now you could also utilize get as a tool for that, right? You could commit and make sure that your working state is already committed and saved onto GitHub and then create a new branch to try to refactor. And if it doesn't work out, you could always check out the prior branch and then delete the one you were working with. But this is just more tools for your ar arsenal. And then to exit node, all you do is hold down control and press C. And then you do it again. And then it finally lets you out. And that's it. And it even tells you there's other things you could do. You could just type in dot exit and that would also let you out. Does anyone have any questions about Node and how that editor worked? Okay, so let's start creating our first script. Can anyone tell me the command for creating a file? Touch. touch. So, yeah, so I'm going to do touch and let's say uh, day three dot js. Okay, now we see day three dot js is populated. It's green. And can anyone tell me why this is showing up as green, whereas objectives MD is not? All right, and it also shows me a U next to it. Does anyone know where that's coming from? It's uh, unsaved or something in it? It's unstaged, right? And it's unstaged, meaning that this is a Git repository, right? And this is showing up green because it's trying to tell me, hey, this is new. This is unstaged. I have no idea what this is and I'm not tracking it. And this is just to let me as a developer know that if I try to do any sort of commit or push, I need to make sure that Git starts tracking this file before I do so. All right. Well, now we have this script. And now let's say I want to just console.log hello again. So let's go console.log and then say hello, Victor. Now, how can I run this script on my terminal? Well, we talked about Node and Node allows me to go into a specific editor in my terminal, but I can also run a JavaScript file through my terminal by utilizing Node. I can say Node day three JS, and when I run that command, we can see that it console.logs hello Victor because that's what I'm returning here or what I'm console.logging from this script here. Does anyone have any questions about how this interaction works? Okay, I'm gonna continue pushing forward, but I want I want to be completely clear with everyone. If I'm not getting questions, I'm going to assume that everyone is going is understanding the material that I'm presenting, um, and there's no way for me to slow down or adjust the pace of the of the course or the the class if I don't know that there's any confusion in the material that I'm presenting. So let's keep pushing forward, and then if anyone has a question, please just let me know. I have a quick. Yeah, what's up, Josh? The in your command line, uh, node that command mm -hmm. to the file day three dot js that yeah. just well say again. What does your um node command do to the file? I see. Yeah, so when I run node day3.js, what it does is node looks for the file day3.js. And once it finds that file, it simply just reads it and then displays the output of that file on my terminal. Awesome.
Yeah, what's up, Cody? Uh, so you would always want to do Node to, and then the file JS, or in Python it would be Python, rather than in VS Code clicking the magic run button, as it were. Yes, that's the practice. That's the best practice that y'all are putting out, right? That is the practice that you should be utilizing, right? Um, using the play button on your terminal is running something on VS Code to actually be able to interpret that code but it's not your operating system actually interpreting that code. Whereas if when you're in the terminal and you run node and then the name of the file, it's your operating system that's reading and interpreting the code. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to make it clear that that's what we want. Okay, perfect. Joshua? So node is it is is it not a, it's not really a programming language, it's more of like a tool used to like use JavaScript, I guess? Yeah, so Node is a framework, right? Kind of how Django is a framework, Node is also a framework. Um, and it's mainly used to interpret JavaScript, yes. Thank you. Of course. Halsey? Yeah, um, is, is there any reason that uh, you would do it in the terminal instead of doing it in the console like you were doing in the beginning when you just did Node? Yeah, if I have a really complicated block of code, and let's say I wanted to experiment and see if I could get a separate output from the one that I had before, I could run it in the terminal. That way I'm not altering the original block of code. And then if it works out, I can just copy and paste it. And if it doesn't work, I can exit and nothing has changed on my actual uh, file. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Course. All right, fantastic. Let's move on into some variables. So as we can see here for variables, we're going to have quite a bit, right? Uh, the main thing for variables, and as we all know by now in JavaScript, there's a couple of different things that we can use to establish a variable. Um, and one of the biggest two, the two things that we're mainly going to use during this program is going to be let and const. Now we've all done pre-work, um, so I would like to ask everyone, who knows the difference between let and const? And what are the benefits of one um, compared to the other? Uh, const is a permanent um, value and yeah. let is mutable. Perfect, yeah, so const is immutable while let is mutable, right? And uh, so funny story about mutable and immutable, and this is the way I remember it after thinking about it. When I used to hear mutable, I used to think of mute, like the mute that you can do on the TV, right? Like a, I'm muting something, uh, but that's not the mute that we're referencing to. When we're talking about mutable, we mean like a mutant, like I can mutate this specific uh, thing to take a different form. So that's the mutable and immutable. Right. And that's ever since I finally understood that, it just finally stuck in my brain. So hopefully that helps you guys out as well. All right. So just like uh, just like Frank said, right, let is mutable. So I can say, oh, that's not it. I can say let um, reading be equal to hello, Victor. Now let's say I say const goodbye, be equal to goodbye. All right, if I try to do something like reading um, plus equals 35, that should work. Just try that out. Okay, well, I didn't get an error, so I know it worked. I can also console.log it if I really want to see it. All right, so we can see hello, Victor, which was the original portion of the string. And then I added 35 towards the end of the string and it says, hello, Victor, 35, All right? So now let's say I try to do something like, uh, goodbye, uh, plus equals 35. And I change this to goodbye. All right, I get an error. And it's telling me, hey, you're trying to do something that 
you know, we, you specifically told me that I shouldn't be doing. So here we can see that it tells me exactly where the error is. So we see node, it, I see the file that I ran. It tells me the path to the file where the problem is. So it tells me, hey, this is inside 3.js slash just intro date 3.js. So that's the file I'm currently located. Then it tells me that the problem is in line seven. And then it even displays line seven for me. So I come over to line seven and I see goodbye plus equals 35. Okay, so I get that that's the problem, but what exactly did I do wrong? So it tells me there's a type error. I'm trying to do an assignment to a constant variable, which I can't do because again, it's a constant, so it's not mutable. It is an immutable variable. I can't change it, so it's giving me an error. I can make a copy of it and try to change its value with a copy, but I can't change its original value because it was established through const. Does anyone have any questions about that? Would you get an error if you tried to change the value of goodbye, like for a let, if you tried to just change it? Let's try it out. Let's see if I could just make it 35. And there it is. We're getting an error again, and it's giving me the same error. It's telling me, hey, you can't assign anything to this variable because it was made a constant. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sorry. I was actually wondering about the let one. If I tried to just change that, would that work? The let, yes. So if I do greeting, and let me change that as well so that we can see it. So now that worked and it just returns 35 because it was let. And we could also see that my text editor is kind of giving me a hint here, right? When I write greeting, it's in, it's in this light blue. Whereas if I write goodbye, it's in this dark blue telling me, hey, you probably shouldn't be touching this. Does that answer your question? Perfect. I see that thumbs up, the flying thumbs up. Yeah, sorry, we have the giant voice system was going a second ago, so I didn't want to. Oh. No, no problem at all. All right, so now we just covered the difference between const and let. There's other things that we can use such as var, um, but we don't wanna get it into all the other things that exist out there since we all know um, programming is kind of like the Russian dolls, right? Once you open up one, there's another 10 or 20 in there and you could keep opening up and going more in depth, but this is the level of uh, depth that we wanna go into at this time. So let's move on to the next one. So the next thing we're going to talk about is functions, and it's just basically constructing a function. So type that out here. All right, so there's a couple of ways of constructing a function. We'll go over the most basic one. Uh, let's say I want to say uh, make a name. Yeah, and this make a name function, maybe it returns um, Cisco Avalon. And then I can see that make a name function real quick. Okay, so let's talk about this real quick. When I go to create a function, the first thing I want to do is utilize the function keyword. Once I write function, in front of something, it tells JavaScript that the following argument is going to be the name of a specific function. Now, what is a function? Well, let's draw that out real quick. I'm sure we've all seen this picture quite a bit of times, right? Where we have this um, kind of like spitting thing. Uh, let's see what I can do here. Okay, that's not working out the way I wanted to. <laughs> There's got to be a way to rotate this. Okay, well, it's not rotating, but I think we can all kind of see the picture and I could just draw it. Okay, so here's my machine, right? 
And my machine is actually a function. It does something. So now a function may take an in input, all right, known as variables or arguments. And after it takes in that input, well, that function may do a couple of things in here. Maybe this function does something like, um, I don't know, add a two plus X, right? And maybe X is up here. So whatever variable comes into this function, it's going to add two into it. And then it's going to spit out Y, which is our output, right? So here we have our arguments, otherwise known as inputs. And here we have our output, otherwise known as return statements. And our function is just a reusable block of code that we can use over and over again, right? Rather than writing it again and again and again, I can just make this function one time. And then that way I can just reutilize that function every time I need that behavior to happen. So there's a concept called dry. Uh, can anyone tell me what that concept stands for? Has anybody heard of it before? Don't repeat yourself. Perfect. Yeah, don't repeat yourself. You're gonna hear this concept quite a bit. I try to remind us of the of little acronyms as much as I can while going through the program, uh, but this one is very key, right? We don't wanna repeat ourselves. So in order to not repeat ourselves, we create functions to make sure that any reusable block of code that does exist, we can just isolate it. And then that way we use it whenever needed and we're not rewriting it over and over again. Okay, so let's go look at some code now. I have this function, make a name, and it returns my name. Currently right now, does it take any arguments? No, it doesn't take any arguments, right? But we know that our output is this return statement that returns Francisco Avila. So now calling that function, well, I can call the function this way. I can say, make a name. I notice that I have my opening and closing parentheses in here, and that's what's actually gonna call this function. Uh, but when I run this, we're going to see that nothing comes out on my terminal. There's nothing being displayed, right? And that's because this is a return statement. It's returning something, but in order for me to actually see it being logged onto my console, I need a console.log that return value. So now I'm going to console.log. I'm going to call the function. That function is going to return my name. And then that's what's going to be logged into my console. So now when I run node day three JS, I can see that my actual name is being displayed on my terminal. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah, I do. Um, so where is, or what is return for? I'm not really sure. What is return for? Yeah, like where where is it returning to? Or yeah, I, I'm really not sure because at first they seem like the same thing because in the practice editors are, in the practice editors they both did the same exact thing, but not in reality do they both do the same thing? Got it. So between by both you're talking about return and what else? Uh, console log. Okay, so return and console.log and their main difference. Got it. So return is for a value to be re to be uh, the output of a function, right? I could simply put this in a console.log statement if I wanted to, All right? I can say console.log and then have my name on there. Uh, but if I do that, when I run this function, all it's going to do is going to say Francisco Avila, right? Because that's what I'm telling this function to do is I'm telling it to console.log. But the actual value of that function is going to be, I believe it's going to say undefined. See, so now it's telling me undefined. So console.log is to log a value onto your terminal. 
whereas the return statement is to give a value to the end of a function call or to something, right? So this is essentially saying, uh, let make a name be equal to um, in Cisco Avalon, right? And this isn't a really simplistic sake. If we start looking at into a more complicated way of utilizing a function and a return statement, um, it'll be easier to understand the difference. But all this is doing is it's returning a value. I apologize to everyone. My dog is all over me. Uh, this is essentially saying that it's going to return a value whenever that function of make a name is called. So here, let me see if I can do this. I'm going to say let full name, and that's going to be equal to make a name. When I console.log full name, what do we think we're going to see on my terminal? You're going to see uh, Francisco Avila. Yeah, I'm going to see Francisco Avila, right? When I run this, now we're going to see Francisco Avila. So full name is just a variable, and I'm giving it the value of whatever is being returned from make a name. So what's being returned from make a name? Francisco Avila. Yeah. So that's the return. So when I go to console.log it, that's what I'm able to see on my terminal. Did that answer your question, Clarice, or did that just make it worse? Uh, maybe not answer it fully. Because I guess can I, it um, seems weird. Oh, wait. I, can I throw Is something there? in there for you that might help? Like a little different. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's like a really super like low level, I guess, thing if you want to look into it, um, heap versus like stack memory. Because functions essentially work on a stack. So in computers, you have like different memory where it's like, you know, if you play a game or something, you launch a, you, you click on the program, it opens, right? But that program exists in your computer before it's running. So it's like a function is, is kind of similar where it's like that data exists only when that function is called. So we call that function when we say, hey, make a name, right? Our program knows, okay, we're going to go in here. We're going to do all this stuff, right? And then we're done. Right until we give it a return statement. When we say, hey, return this, we're going to say at the end of it, we want you to deliver this from where you were just called from. And once you look up like stack memory and you can see like a visual of everything stacking up. So, you know, like, okay, well, I'm at the top to get to the bottom. I have to unstack, you know, like if you have plates, you're going to pull from the bottom. So yeah, look up stack memory and it, uh, it goes pretty in depth. It's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm thinking the return statement just ends the function, but if it was console.log, it's like, uh, I don't know if it's still, the function is still functioning. Yeah. Is that, so, is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, if you console.log something, the function's still, still running, essentially, or it can continue to do other behavior. Whereas if you utilize your return statement, it's returning a specific value, saying this is where the function ends, and this is the value I'm returning. Okay, cool. Awesome. And I saw another hand up. I don't know if I missed it. Uh, yeah, that was me. Um, okay. So <clears throat> I just had a question about calling the function. So console.log is the, is the command that we always use to call the function in JavaScript, or are there other ways of calling the function? So calling the function, is just actually writing the function name and then putting the parentheses next to it. This is calling the function. The reason why I'm adding a console.log is because I want to see its return value being logged onto my terminal. Got it. Awesome. Okay, and then the console.log, that's, that's equivalent to the print statement in Python, right? Exactly, yes. Okay, got it, thanks. Of course. All right. Now let's try to talk about functions that do take in arguments, right? Because this isn't dynamic at all. I'm just having it return my actual name. 
but that's not necessarily what I want. What if what I wanted to do is take in a first name and a last name? Well, then I can say first name and last name. And instead of my return statement being Francisco Avila, I can say full name is equal to, and I want to use let there, first name plus a space plus last name. So now instead of returning Francisco Avila, it should return the full name. Okay, so now we can see that we made a couple of changes to this function. It's now taken in two arguments. It's taken in two separate things that it's going to work with. Now it's gonna use that first name. It's going to add a space into it because it's expecting a string. And then it's going to add the last name to create a full name. And then that full name is what's going to be returned from the make a name function. So let's say I wanna do uh, John and then let's go with John McCoy, why not? So now when I run this script, do we expect to see anything in our terminal? And if so, what do we expect to see? You wouldn't see anything because you haven't console logged anything. Yeah. I won't see anything because nothing is being console.logged. So now I add the console.log statement. And now I'm passing in John McCoy. So what do I expect to see on my terminal now? John McCoy. John McCoy. Yeah, John McCoy. Let's go ahead and run this script. And now we can see that John McCoy is being printed out. All right, I'm passing in this argument. The argument is being used. It's adding a space in between, just like we wanted it to. And then it's utilizing that last name of McCoy. And then it's returning that value so that we can have a fully functional function. Does everyone understand how parameters work with functions? Okay, got a bunch of head nods. So let's keep going. All right, that's gonna be it for functions for now. We'll go into a different way of writing functions later on. But the next thing we're gonna be covering now is going to be data types. So we have a couple of different data types. The first ones we're gonna talk about is strings. Now, strings are a little weird because they are technically immutable, right? I can't manipulate a string. I can create copies of strings uh, but I can't just insert something new into a string at some point. Um, I'm trying to think a way that I could demonstrate that to everyone. Well, let's first go into a string and let's look at the things that we can do. So let's say my string, or actually we already have greeting. So let's grab greeting again and This is a string and this is how I work. Okay, so a string has many different built-in methods. Um, we're not gonna necessarily cover all of them right now, but let's talk about the greeting, right? A string underground or everything under the hood is kind of interpreted in a form of an array right, where everything has specific places and we can grab specific values from that specific place. So in this case, let's say I wanna grab the length of this greeting. Well, I can do something like console.log length, and actually I think it's greeting.length. Now when I run this, uh, dot link is not a function. There you go. So now it tells me there's 39 characters in there, All right? So I can go ahead and count each one of them, but I really don't want to. We know that there's 39 characters in there. Now, if I wanted to talk about this as far as indexes, 
I would have the index from zero to 38 because length starts counting at one, but in indexes, we start counting from zero. So can anyone tell me how I could grab, uh, let's say this A from and in greeting, if I want to just console.log that specific A, how could I do that? You could do no. last, oh. oh, I was gonna say you can do the last index of A and start from there. No. Yeah, definitely. I could also, yeah, you know, do the old school zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, go ahead. I think somebody was trying to talk. Okay. Well, I can just try to do greeting and then say, well, I want to see what's at greeting eighteen. When I do that, we can see that I get an end. That's because this end next to the end, right? I can grab 17 and that finally returns the A, All right? Notice that the spaces are also considered a place in my string. I can do 16. And when I run this, it returns the single space in there. Um, but that's basically something that I can do with string. I can grab very specific indexes out of that string to be able to um, you know, any sort of check or manipulation with it. Now, I can also add strings to one another. I can say greeting and then person. You can say this person, let's say it's Adam. And now I can just console.log. Nope, hello. Greeting plus Adam or a person, I apologize. And we can see that when I run this, it's going to take this string and it's going to add Adam. Now notice that work and Adam are connected. And that's because there's no space here. If I wanted to put a space, I could do something like this. And I can see this is a string and this is how I work. And then it says Adam at the end. And here's the space. Or I can just add an empty space inside of the addition. Right? This is a string. And this is I work at. Them. Oh, go ahead, Josh. It's kind of off topic, but um, if I'm like typing code into the file and then um, trying to go back to the terminal and run it, is there like a, a simpler way to like, or do I have to click every time? Click in the top window, the bottom window. Uh, I've always clicked. I'm sure there is a simpler way, but I just don't know it off the top of my head. Okay, awesome. Okay, there's also, we've already created a function that could do this, but there's also something called interpolated string, which we haven't talked about yet. So to create interpolated string, instead of utilizing the double quotes or the single quotes to create a string, I'm gonna use the backticks. And those backticks will then let me create variables inside of it. So I'm going to go ahead and use the money sign and then put down those curly brackets. That will allow me to do greeting. Then right after that, again, I could use the money sign in curly brackets and I could put person. Now, when I run this script, it's going to say, this is a string and this is how I work and then add them. And then somebody just shared that you could use control tilde. Yeah, for what Josh just asked, sorry. Yeah, I'm trying it, but it doesn't seem like it's working on my end. All right, well, I'll have to learn that trick later on. All right, so this is an interpolated string. These are the very basic things that you can do with strings. Doesn't seem like we have anything uh, as far as methods that we want to go into. Um, but in the case that we ever need to use methods, we could always go and we need to look them up. We could always go into ND, ND school, I think it's called. And then you look up JavaScript. Uh, da -da. Oh, WS schools? Maybe yeah. WS3 or something. Yeah. 
WSU. There you go. And then if you go into WS School JavaScript, uh, we can see that it has pretty much everything in there. We can see strings, tells us how strings works. We could do some examples. Um, it goes over the different string methods that we can utilize to be able to actually practice them. Um, they're searching that you can utilize for strings. Here we can see the index of, and we can tell it which one to look for. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of different things that we can utilize with strings. It looks like in the if in the efforts of time, we're not going to be covering these today. Um, but please know that those tools are out there in case you need to use them. Hey, Francisco, quick question about the string interpolation. Is, is it mandatory to use the back ticks when doing that or, can, or no? Yes, when you're doing string interpolation in JavaScript, you have to use the back ticks. Otherwise, it does it won't recognize these uh these money signs and curly brackets as a signifier that this is going to be a variable. So if I change this to just be a string and then I run my script, it's actually just going to say money sign reading money sign person. Okay, copy that. Perfect. All right, great. So that's pretty simple data type structure that we just covered. The next one's gonna be numbers. And numbers are pretty simple. Um, there's really nothing special to it. We all know what a number is, um, but let's take a look here. So with numbers, we got, uh, you know, positive and negative numbers, but it looks like the one thing that would be useful to make sure that we cover would be math. So let's do some math here. Now, math is something that comes built in with JavaScript. We can utilize it to do different math functions, such as pow. And pow is just basically going to say take it the first integer or the first argument, and it's going to times it by the power of whatever it is you're trying to place here. So if we do two, this would be three times three and it would return nine. All right, so let's console.log that real quick. Will you ever have to import math for JS like you do with Python? No, you will not. Yeah, now when I run this, we can see that it gave me nine, right? Another really useful thing is like math.floor. So let's do that. So console.log, math.floor. And math.floor, let's say I do some crazy number and I divide it by three. That shouldn't go in there evenly. Uh, actually, let's see it first without math.floor. Okay, so we can see that it gives me another crazy number, but it doesn't end evenly, right? It gives me this 0.3333. Well, now if I utilize math.floor and I run it, it's just going to round to the very bottom one. So it's going to give me 411522. And just like floor, there is something called seal. And it would just do the opposite, where rather than going down to two, it would round up to three. Okay. Other than that, know that decimals are also considered as a number. Anything that's in, that's number related will be a number data type, right? In Java, I mean, in Python, we have something like floats and other things that we can utilize. And that is a very good question, Megan. Let me actually try it out. No, there is not a difference between the two. Just that one of them is using math and the other one is just using the actual operator that comes built in with JavaScript. All right. The next thing we're going to go over is Booleans. So here we go.
Okay, so Booleans are pretty simple. They're just true and false, right? But the one thing that I would like to cover is true the and falsy statements. So now an empty data structure, such as a string, would be considered false. I could do something like this. And let me console.log that. Oh, that's not working out the way I wanted it to. Interesting. Looks like it's not able to do that comparison here. Hmm. I think it's because you're using the strict and you have to do the implicit, the two double equals to do the uh, comparison. Oh, that would make sense. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we can see that I'm comparing false, right, to this um, string. So it's not comparing the data type as well. And it's not comparing the data type because I'm only using double equals instead of triple equals. So now it's analyzing, hey, is this empty string something that could be considered false? And it's telling me, yes, it is. That's why it's coming back as true, All right? And the same thing goes with zero. If I do something like zero and I run this, it's gonna return true. Now, why is it important to know um, true the and falsy? Um, everyone should have done the application process. And in the application process, there's the very first question there is, is X's and O's, right? And you're counting uh, how many X's and how many O's are in the string. And if they're the same, it should return true. And if they're not the same, it should return false. So something that I consistently see is you build out your loop, you have your X and O's, right? And by the end of it, let's say um, X is five and O is six, right? I always see this. I always see if X is equal to O return true, and then I see else return false. Now, you could do something like this, but you could also just do something where you simply return if x is equal to o, right? Because we know that this is going to return false, and it's just it's easier that way. Right, it's just going to automatically trigger that rather than doing this whole if and else statement because this is already doing a comparison. This is already returning a true or false value. Don't go into writing the if and else statement because at that point you're just writing extra code that you don't need to. And same thing if you ever have a value such as zero, rather than writing if whatever is equal to zero return false, or if you have a conditional statement that you're waiting on a specific value. Let's say you want to make sure that something actually exists inside of a dictionary. I mean, sorry, something actually exists inside of an object. If it returns undefined, that's going to be falsy, right? So you don't need to do the whole um, if and else statement, write comparisons where when you already understand truthy and falsy. So let's actually look at that. Let's look at let's look at undefined, and let's see if that's equal to false. Huh, interesting. This one's also giving me false for whatever reason. Maybe I could do it this way. If undefined. Okay. So now I have an undefined variable, right? And I'm saying, hey, if this is undefined, just console.log false and otherwise console.log true. Interesting. So it's giving me else. It's going into the else statement. That's interesting. Well, I wonder what happens if I do no. Oh, actually I expected it to do that. I got these mixed up, I apologize. Okay, so null, that should also return false. Okay, we see false. If I do undefined, that should return false. 
if I do an empty string, such as this, that will also return false. But now if I start giving it value, so let's say I have a value, now I should start seeing true, right? Because it's actually occupying memory space. It has value behind it. So now it's considered truthy. Same things with numbers. If I do zero, zero will return false. Whereas if we give it a value such as two, and I run the script, it now returns true. Okay, so that's the difference between truly and falsely statements. Does anyone have any questions on that? And I also did ramble for quite a bit, so I assume there are some questions. What's the difference between undefined and null? Because I compared them and it says they're equal. So I guess like, what's the difference? Yeah, that's a great question. So undefined and null, right? So I can say something like, hey, let um, let something be equal to null, right? And now something doesn't have a value. But what if I do console.log and I just do some gibberish, right? Um, I do not exist. Okay, well, when I run this, it's going to give me an error and it's going to tell me is not defined, right? So this is undefined. When something comes back and it doesn't come back as something that's defined, so it doesn't have a data type, it doesn't have a value, it's going to give me undefined. Whereas null is actually a data. It's something that, that I can utilize. If I do something in here and I run that, rather than receiving an error, I'm just going to receive null. Both of them represent that they're empty and that they have no value assigned to them. But the difference is that undefined means you yourself never established that variable or gave it a value, whereas null means you established the variable, but it never got a value. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Of course. Let's repeat that one more time. Yeah, so undefined means that you didn't make the variable and it never got a value. Whereas null means you made the variable, but it never received a value. And I see Sean on there saying like, null is like a placeholder. And yes, a lot of people do utilize null as a placeholder, right? They create a variable that they're gonna be utilizing later on and they just assign null into it so that, it, so that they can know that the variable exists. Um, but it, only if a specific condition is met, then it receives a value. Otherwise it just remains as none. Does that answer your question, Sean? Yep, thank you. Of course. Okay, we've been going on for exactly an hour. Let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break and let's come back at 10.15 to continue our lecture. Thank you so much, everyone. All right, welcome back, everyone. We just went over truthy and falsy, and we haven't really covered this comparison operators just yet. So let's go ahead and go into some comparison operators. I think that's where we're at now. Yep, truthy and falsy. Here we are, comparison operators. So <clears throat> we've gone over a couple. We, we've already kind of demonstrated a little bit of um, comparison operators. But let's uh, let's try to take a look here. So now, obviously, comparison operators come with conditional statements, um, but maybe I can just console.log them instead. And let's just go ahead and say I want to console.log if a string is equal to a string. Now, when I run this, this is going to return true, right? And if I were to change anything inside of the value, now remember that triple equals is a strict operator. So that means it's checking both the value of the data type and the type of that data. So when I run this, it will return false. Now, something a little bit more clear on how we can see that is if I run three and three, so this is a number of three and I'm comparing that to a string of three. Well, when I run this, this would return false, right? But if I were to take away 
one equal sign and turn it into a comparison where it's compare it's only comparing a, the value and not also comparing the data type. When I want to run this, it returns true. That could be a little confusing. And honestly, I don't think I've ever actually had any any reason to use a double equal sign rather than a triple equal sign. So I would recommend that everybody always uses the triple equal sign. Now, does everyone understand how those the differences between the double equals and the triple equals works? Okay, good. So we're good with that. And now let's go into a, the, I think the next thing we have, we already covered that. Let me double check here. Okay, comparisons. We have undefined and null. We already went over that. Okay, so the next thing we have is arrays, objects, and then pass by value and pass by reference. So let's take a look at some arrays, All right? So let my array be equal to. So I'm assigning a variable and calling it my array. And to actually create an array, all I'm going to do is put square brackets. Now there's different values that can go into this array. I can put names. I can place um, multiple types of strings. So I can put some interpolated string in here. All right, I can also put something like an actual number. So these are the these are the three different things that we've talked about thus far. So I'm not going to go any crazier than that. Maybe I could even just put a boolean in there. So notice that this array is essentially just a box of boxes, right? And let me try to draw that out. So an array, in reality, all it is is one massive box that holds a bunch of little boxes inside of it, each one of them holding their own placement and separated by a comma. Now I went over this earlier, but whenever you're counting about places or counting places within a data structure or a data type, you always start from zero, right? So that means that each one of these would have a value starting at zero. So let me grab that really quick. So now there's zero. Oh, Jesus. Here's one. This might be easier if I do it this way. Okay, so in total, we have four items inside of this array. But as far as placements go or indexes go, we have indexes zero through three. That should be pretty easy to understand. And now if we take a look at our code, we can see that at index zero, we have names. At index one, we have an interpolated string with the number 35. And then we have the number 89. And then we have a simple Boolean variable of false. So let's try out a little bit of an activity here. Um, how can I console.log false from my array? So how can I grab false? from my array. Anybody want to take a stab at that? By using its index? Yeah, great. So let's go my array. What index would that be? Three. 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 Yeah, index three. Now, when I run this, we can see that it gives me false. Okay, <clears throat> great. If I print, if I console.log the entire array, When I run this, we can see that it gives me names, 35, 89, and false. If I wanted to do <clears throat> maybe just indexes one, two, and three, or I mean zero, <clears throat> zero, one, and two, then maybe I can do something like this. Right, so there I'm grabbing from zero to two. So it's giving me index zero. It's giving me index one. 
Now it doesn't give me index two because it, this function of slice is exclusive, meaning that whatever argument I pass it as, it's, as its limit, like, hey, this is where you're going to stop, it's not going to include it in its return value. So that's why it only returns index zero and one. If I wanted to see 89, then I would just simply have to switch that to three. And now we can see names, 35 and 89. Arrays are pretty simple. They're just boxes within boxes. Um, and you can have different values inside of it. You can even have other arrays in there, right? So I can open it up, have another array. And inside this array, I can have the number 24, 128, 126, and maybe a string of second array. So from what we just saw, how could I grab 126 from my array? Uh, you would do index four followed by index two or index one. Yeah, let's try it out. So now we can see that it went into index four. So here's zero. Here's one, two, three. And then it goes into index four. All right, great. So now inside of index four, we told it to grab index one. So here's zero and here's index one. So console.log logs 126 onto my terminal. Does anyone have any questions about how you can iterate through an array? This may be some dry content since I'm assuming everyone who did the pre-work is pretty familiar with this. So I apologize. All right. Now, how can I add items into an array? Well, we have the dot push method. So let's say my array dot push. And I add, this is new. So let's console.log my array first. Then afterwards, we'll console.log my array afterwards so that we can see the difference between the two. Well, when I run this in node, we can see the first console.log statement. All right, there's one single array. It has names, 35, 89, false, and then it has our secondary or nested array in there. Well, when a console.logs the second time, it still has names 35 and false on our second array. But notice that after our second array or our nested array, it has another element called this is new. Well, that this is new element is coming from that dot push method. Does anyone have any questions about how dot push works? No, dot push will always add whatever argument you're pushing into it at the end of the array, all right? So if you have a bunch of dot pushes coming under it, if each one of those will go towards the end. Could you show us how to push something into the nested array? Yeah, definitely. So this is a nested array, right? So if I wanted it to go inside of that nested array, I would just say to enter index four. So then I'll go into my array. I'll go index zero, index one, index two, index three, index four, grab that array. And then at index four, it will push this is new. So after second array, there will be a comma and I'll see this is new. So now I run this, we can see the first console.log statement and then the secondary console.log statement shows me this is new nested within the nested array. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about is objects and their key and value pairs. Nestled in the nested, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some objects real quick. 
Now, <clears throat> objects are a really powerful data, data type, and they're going to be really important when we start working with our actual web development. Almost all of the communication that's going to happen within our front end or back end are going to be in an object format. Now, if I were to show you something really quick about why objects are important, we're going to get really accustomed to this API later on. This is called the Pokey API. And what this API does is it basically gives you a bunch of feedback about any Pokemon that you try to submit in here, right? So I can do something like search for Charizard. And when I click the submit button, it's going to give me back this object. Now it doesn't look like an object, but if I view it in pure JSON, now we can see that it is actually an object with specific keys. Each key may have an array. So in this case, the abilities key has an array. And inside of that array, there's an object for each individual ability, right? And we can see it developing. And later on, when we go into actually communicating between our front end and back end, we're going to need to be able to manipulate these data structures. We need to be able to go inside these objects, inside of these arrays, and grab all of these nested values, right? In case I want to actually display the abilities of a Pokemon, well, I would need to know how to go inside of this dictionary, of this object, grab the abilities key, go inside of the array at index one, grab the ability key one more time, and then afterwards grab the key for name so that I can return Blaze and I can display it on my web app, right? Or maybe I just want to console.log it or whatever it is. But it's important to know how to actually work with these data structures so that you can grab information and display it on your application. So an object. I'm going to copy this object that we have here. It's called a database object. And all an object is, is just key value pairs, right? <clears throat> In JavaScript, you could do this thing where you can have numbers um, be represented as the key. You could also do it in Python. Um, I don't necessarily recommend it unless it's like an ID, which is what it's showing us here. So in this case, we would have the ID of, four fifth, of 457 be the ID for Tom, who's age 34, and then the ID of 57782, have a object of Sally and 42. Now, you can do this this way. You can also wrap this up in, in uh, quotation marks just so that they're always a string, but your keys for a specific, uh, for a specific value, right? So this is the key, and this is the value paired up to it. In JavaScript, it's going to let you write the key without putting quotation marks around it. In Python, it won't. It's going to force you to put quotation marks around it. Now, it's up to you whichever one of the two you would like to do. Um, but I strongly recommend that every time you write an object in JavaScript, you always put the keys in quotation marks. Just that there's no confusion and everything's nicely formatted for you whenever you're switching between the two languages. OK, so now with that said, if I wanted to go into my database, right, and I wanted to, let's say I just want to console.log the database itself. Well, when I run this script, <clears throat> it's actually going to run, and it's going to show me that, that object. Notice that node automatically turned those keys into strings, right? So 457 and 57782 are now interpreted as strings, even though in the here, their numbers. But it knows that since it's inside of an object, it can manipulate them and turn them into strings once they're being shown. OK, and then we have our nested objects within them. Well, let's say I wanted to grab um, Sally's age, right? Well, I know Sally's ID number is 57782. And if I run that, well, now we can see that my my object got smaller, right? First, I had an object that represented the entire database. But after I told it a specific ID number, well, now I'm getting an object that corresponded to the key of 57782. So now that I have this object, which only gives me the name and age of this person, how could I grab the number 42 out of this object? Use another pair of brackets after the number and type uh, quote um, 
page. Perfect. So now when I run this, it gives me 42 because that's the age that's corresponding to Sally. Does anyone have any questions about how I iterated through that through that object? I was wondering if you could also use dot notation in this instance. Yeah, let's Would try that it out. Be viable. Let's see if we can use dot notation. So now we just use bracket notation, and that's literally using the square brackets, and that's called bracket notation. And then what Frank, I believe, is referencing to is dot notation, where I use a dot to try to grab a key. So now this is an object, and it's basically creating a a class under the hood. So when I do dot after database, JavaScript knows that there's only two keys inside of it or two properties inside of it that I can use. So it suggests us to either use 457 or 57782. So if I wanted to grab Tom and just grab the name, I would use 457, but notice that it defaulted to square brackets. Now I wonder why, All right? Let's say I do 457. Well, that's giving me a squiggly line, right? And it's telling me that it expected a comma. So that's weird. If I do square brackets, four, five, seven, it works perfectly fine. But if I try to use dot notation with a number, it doesn't work. So now I wonder, what if I turn this four, five, seven into a string? It still defaults to dot notation. All right, and let's try to actually manually put it in. Oh, yeah, it still doesn't recognize it. So now let's try to give it a name. Let's say person one. Now I do dot person one. Well, now notice that it's not a number. And because it's not a number, I'm actually able to utilize dot notation to enter that key, All right? And if I want the name, well, I could just do name. And now I can see Tom. So that's the problem with utilizing something like numbers. You know, it starts kind of getting in the way whenever you're trying to do something like dot notation or square brackets. Um, but you could definitely use dot notation to enter things. Um, just keep in mind that if it's a number, it's going to only allow you to use square brackets or bracket notation. Does that answer your question, Frank? Yes. Sorry, I can't see you on the. Oh, perfect. I see that. Yes. Uh, I got you. Okay. And I see something from Brian. I believe it will work if you're bracket, if you bracket the number, but dot the age. Okay. I'm a little confused by the comments on the chat. Anybody want to tell me what they're trying to say? Oh, um, yeah, just if you do database and then use bracket notation for the 57782, but then use dot afterward for age or name, it should work. Oh, yeah, you can definitely do that. Um, so let's say 57782, that's going to automatically turn it into that. But then I could still use name, right? Because that's not an actual, um, that key is not a number. So you could still use dot notation afterwards. You just can't use it with numbers. Numbers have to be inside of bracket notation. I was just saying you didn't uh, quote name in this example, but you were using quotations around age uh, in, the, in the previous example, and I wanted to know why. Oh, you're talking about when I did bracket notations like this? Yeah. OK. So if I do name like that, I'm actually trying to tell this object that I want to add a key of name. I'm not telling this object to grab name. I'm telling it that I want to add a key of name. And notice that my editor is already scratching it out for me. And if I hover over it, it's going to tell me, hey, this is deprecated because it's, it already exists, right? I can't just add something into it. So instead, I have to actually call it by its value of name. And that's when it's in square brackets, All right? So let's say that I, even if I wanted to do something that didn't exist, so something like, uh, 
uh, let's say older, right? I have to put it in quotation marks so that it's able to reckon to to recognize that I'm trying to grab something. And if I take it out and I run it, it's just going to simply tell me, hey, this is undefined. And if I put it in quotation marks, it's still going to tell me this is undefined. But rather than returning an error, it's just going to return undefined. Did that address your question, Cody? Yeah, yeah. And if you went over it twice, uh, thank you anyways, because I think that's really important. Yeah, of course. Uh, Joshua? Is it is it best practice to just use brackets so then you can just access everything? I would try to stick to square um, to bracket notation just so that you you have the syntax between Python and JavaScript somewhat similar uh, and you guys aren't getting it confused. You could use dot notation, but I would prefer it if we stick to dot notation once we start writing our programs in object oriented programming. Awesome. And then Anthony. Hey, just for like a quick uh, lingo review. So the 57782 is referred to as one more time. Uh the 57782 or the person one is that's the key. Yep. These are the keys, right? And then the and then objects are the values. Okay. Okay. All right, Clarice. Uh, can you access, I guess, the like name and age without knowing which person it is? Without knowing which person it is. Uh, do you mean without knowing? Like, like without the numbers? Yeah. Uh, you can, uh, but then at that point, you would have to essentially iterate through the database, right? Um, there would have to be some commonality as far as these keys go um, without knowing, in this case, the way this is set up, each ID would be unique. So you would have to know the ID of the individual in order to be able to grab them. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I think, let me see if I can do something here. Let me say four. Yeah. Okay, so you could also do that. You could iterate through the keys that are inside of the object. And then once you iterate through the keys, then inside of the object, you could all you could just console.log and then do database uh, key and then dot name. I think that's the next one. Yeah. Or you know what, we'll just stick to the square brackets for consistency. Right, so now we can see the original number, which is this console dialog from the key, and then we see Sally because that's the other the other thing that's there. Then we see the person one key and Tom. Right, I'm just simply using a for loop to iterate through the keys of that object and be able to grab those values. Was that what you were looking for, Clarice? Yep. Okay. Perfect. All right. Any other questions? I think I saw a hand up. Yeah, what's up? So it, in this instance, maybe I'm I'm just confused here. Are are you showing like is the database also an object? And then it's so it's its keys are other objects that then have values of keys and values. Am am I going crazy here, or is that what am I, is that how it's working here? Yeah. So the database is an object. Uh, the keys are either strings or numbers. But the values for those keys are also objects that have keys and value pairs, right? So some of these could be arrays. Uh, the value of a key could be any data structure. It could be a string. It could be another dictionary. It could be another object. It could be another array. Um, you know, essentially, we could have this nested with a nest and nest and nest of different data, depending on how we want our data to look. Does that answer your question? Okay, perfect.
All right. Let's keep pushing forward now. All right, so the next thing we have is function types. And this is by type and by reference, I believe is the next thing we're gonna talk about. Okay, and functions by type and by reference, the object database does not have indices, right? Uh, Josh, what do you mean by indices? Like index one? No, it does not. It does not have such a thing as index zero and index one. It only has the keys to be able to reference by. Um, you could access something like database.keys, I believe, and that will return to you an array of keys, uh, but that's a little bit more um, in-depth than we want to go right now. Did that answer your question, Josh? Okay, perfect. And then Sean, unordered. Is it unordered? I think dictionaries stay ordered uh, when you iterate through them. But actually, now as I'm looking at the way it iterated when I did the for in loop, it looks like it went backwards. So maybe it prioritizes by data types. There must be a way that it sorts itself, uh, but I'm not, I don't know it off the top of my head how it sorts the values inside in the background. All right. So now moving forward to these functions. Let's talk about functions that are by object and by ref, I mean, by reference and by value. Okay, let me grab this function really quick. So we have this function, make a name. And for this function, make a name, when we called it, we actually passed in two values into it. We passed in John and we passed in McCoy. Well, this is a function that works by value. I'm passing in values into it to be able to work. Now, a function by reference, will typically work with an object. And the way it works is when it receives the object, it tries to do something to a value of that object. So let, I mean, to a specific uh, field of that object. So let's take a look at this. Let's say I'm going to copy from this from our curriculum real quick, just so that I have it. So I have an object with the name of Tom and the age of 34, which is the same one that we had up here, all right? Well, let's say that I wanted um, Tom's age to be increased, or whenever I pass this specific object into this function, I want the age to be increased. Well, let's say I create the function. So I say function increase age. All right, and this function is going to take in an object. So I'm gonna use OBJ as an abbreviation so that it knows that it's receiving an object. And then all I'm going to say is object.age is equal to object.age plus one, right? So it's going to receive the object. The object is then going to try to grab the age property if it exists, right? Or the age key. And if it does exist, it's going to add one into it. Right? Otherwise, this is going to bring back undefined if age doesn't exist, and then it's going to create an error. But now, when I go to call this function, I can say increase age. And it's looking for an object. I need to pass an object into it. So I'm going to pass my object. Right? So when I pass my object into it, I'm going to change the property of age and add one into it. Okay, so now when I console.log my object, we should see a different age. Instead of 34, we should see 35. Okay, so see we here we see name of Tom, just like we had before. But now we see the age has changed from 30, 34 to 35. And that's because when I call this function, increase age, and I pass in the object into it, it grabs the age key and adds one to the value and then assigns it to age. So now when I go to console.log in line 69, we can see the name of Tom and the age of 35. Does anyone have a question about how a function working with an object works? Uh, I have a quick one, Francisco. When inside the function, we use object.age.notation. I guess 
Um, how come you didn't use bracket notation there as we were talking about earlier? Yeah, no, I could definitely still use bracket notation. Um, so I can still use age in there. And that would still work perfectly just fine. Um, the main reason why I use dot notation is because I'm, I've been working in OP and it just came out as a reflex, but thank you. I'll make sure to, I'll keep myself more in check around those bracket notations. Did that answer your question, Robert? Yeah, that answers it. Thank you. All right. Okay. The next thing we have are if and else statements. So let me just kind of comment all of this out. And let's go into some if and else statements. Is that the next thing we have? What do we have? Yes, we do have if and else. Okay. So let's go into if, else, and else if. Okay. So now, if is something to evaluate if a condition is actually true or not. So I can say if three is greater than five, then I want you to, let's say console.log, um, three is greater. Then I can say else if, or let's just stick with else for now. Then I can say else, I want you to console.log, three is less than. Okay, so when I run this, I would obviously see three is less than because we know that three is not greater than five, all right? So now let's say I wanna add an else if in there. And let's say I wanna say three is equal to three. Three is three, all right? So when this runs down, it's going to trigger the very first statement. It's gonna say, okay, well, is three greater than five? It's gonna say, no, it's not. So it's gonna move on to our else if statement. And this one would obviously trigger true. What's well, gonna say else if three is equal to three, and then it's going to console.log three is three. And then else, it's just gonna give us less than three. But we know that that's not the case. It's gonna give us three is three. I can also change that and make it into a four. And now when I run it, we can see three is less than three. So we'll check the if statement first. If the if statement fails, it will check the else if statement. If that also fails, it will default to the else. You could have as many else ifs as you want. Um, you could have three, four, five, whichever you need to do to check. Think of else as your escape, right? So none of my conditions that I listed were met. So now that none of those specific conditions were met, do this by default. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay, so let's talk about some itinerary statements in that case. All right, so itinerary statements are pretty simple. Let's say I want my age to be equal to 21, all right? And I just wanna see if the person can drink or cannot drink. So let's say let uh, drinking age, and I'm going to set that to a tenory statement. So I'm gonna say if age is greater than or equal to 21, and then I'm gonna write a question mark on it. So now this is turning the left side of the question mark is now an if statement, all right? Now to the right of that question mark, is what happens if it's true. So of drinking age, and I, apparently I can't spell. And then after that, I'm gonna separate this by a colon and to the right side of this colon would be my else statement. So to the left side of the question mark, I got my if statement. To the left side of the colon, I got what happens if that if statement comes back true. And to the right side of the colon, I got what happens if it comes back false. Not 
able to drink. So now when I go to console.log, this drinking age, what do we think we're gonna see on the terminal? Of drinking age? Yeah, let's check it out. Let's say node A3JS, and we see a drinking age, right? If I turn this to 18 and then I run it, we can see that it the return value or the value that was assigned to drinking age is not able to drink. And that's tenary statements. Any questions around tenary statements? I have a question. Uh, when is it preferable to use this more than like the long blocks of if else? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so if you only know that there's only a true and false possibility, I recommend using um, the tenary statement. And also if you think it's short enough to where you can fit it within one line, right? If it's something that you know is gonna take up multiple lines, then I would just default to the if and else statement. And that's just for code readability, like just to be able to read your code, right? But if it's something as simple, as simple as this, as what I have on line 75, where it's one line, it's no longer than 90 characters, and I could just, it's easy to read and understand, then I would just do it as a temporary statement. It's mostly user preference. Does that answer your question? Yes. Perfect. All right, we are moving. The next thing we have now is going to be loops. So let's talk about loops real quick. And then after that, we'll go on a break. All right, so loops. There's a couple of different types of loops. We got while loops, we got for of loops, and we got for in loops. Oh, and we also have for i loops because this is JavaScript. All right, so let's say I have an index of 100, right? So let number be equal to 100. And I wanted that number to count down from 100 to zero. Well, I can say while, number is greater than zero. Well, then I can say console.log number. And then I need to actually make that number come down, right? Because if I just run this right now, it's going to conduct this behavior as long as this condition is evaluated as true. So right now we know that 100 is greater than zero, right? And if I run it, we can see I'm stuck in an infinite loop. I just have a bunch of 100s being printed out. And that's because I didn't set a condition that would decrement number. Well, now I can just do number minus equals one. And now when I run it, we can see that it goes from 100 and it iterates through 90s, 80s, 70s, all the way down to one. And once the value of number became zero, it was no longer greater than zero. So this while loop ended. So I can say console.log end of while loop. And just for simplicity's sake, let's just make this 10. Okay, and now we can see a line for 10 through one. Once the while loop ended, it went on to line 96 and it console.log end of while loop. Does anyone have any questions about while loops? This is probably the easiest one that we can cover. Okay. Perfect, no questions about while loops. Let's keep moving forward then. We could probably cover four I loops real quick. Okay, so just like a while loop, 
we had while the number is greater than zero, and we had this let number equals 10. Well, let's do a four I. So I'm going to say four, and then I'm going to say let I. Or we could even just call it number again. All right, but typically you'll see something like let four I, and then let's make this 10. Then I'm going to separate it by semicolon. So this is my number is equal to 10. The next thing that comes after that semicolon is the condition how long I want this to do it for. Well, I want this to continue while I is greater than zero, All right? which is the same thing I had in my while loop here. And then what I want to have as a repetitive condition at the end of this loop, well, I got this number minus equals one. So now I can say I minus minus. Now, when I open this up, I can console.log. Let's say I just want to console.log I. So let's run that. And we can see it worked exactly the same. We have from numbers 10 all the way down to one. Once it make came zero, it didn't console.log that I. And just like before, we could console.log end of for loop. So now we run it, we see 10 through one. Once the for loop has ended, we see end of for loop. Does anyone have any questions about how for I loops work? Um, no. Yes. Is there a reason why I would use a for loop versus a while loop? Yeah, that's a really good question. So why would I prefer to use a for loop versus a while loop? Uh, notice that a while loop is kind of more free reign, right? I could establish a variable to run my comparison against it. And then I myself have to make sure that this number minus equals one is there, right? If I don't put it there, it's just gonna get me stuck in an infinite loop. While in a for loop, a for loop requires you to make something that it's gotta iterate through so that it knows how many times it's gonna do the repetition. It requires you to explicitly tell it the condition that it's supposed to meet. And then it requires you to tell it what is it that you want it to happen at the end of each individual loop. So a for loop has a lot more structure and control while a while loop doesn't, right? I could essentially run this while loop as long as I want. And maybe I have some other sort of conditional statement in there to make this while loop stop while a for loop knows when it's going to stop and how it's going to get there. Does that answer your question, Caleb? Um, yeah, so why would I use a while loop? So why would you use a while loop? For, yes. Yeah, so while loops, the main thing that I've seen while loops being used for is let's say you want to make a terminal program, like a game or something that you could use on the terminal and you have a specific menu or a specific thing that you want to be displayed over and over again on the terminal, you would put that inside of a while loop and it would run as long as it's true. And then once the player or whatever it is, a client decides to exit the game, that true statement would turn into a false and it would kill the while loop and kill your game. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, everyone, we've been going on for an hour. So let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Uh, currently, it's 11.01. Let's come back at 11.06 and finish off the second portion of our lecture. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, welcome back, everyone, to our quick uh, JavaScript overview. We're almost there. We only got a couple more things to cover. We're currently here at loops. So we only have this last, I think, uh, about 10 lines to cover. So we're good, making good time. So let's go ahead and continue our loops. Uh, the last thing that I just finished covering was our for i loops. So let's talk about our for of loops. Well, a for i loop, I was able to create a variable, which was i, and uh, made my statements. Well, what if I have an object that I can use a for of loop, right? So let's say, let uh, my object be equal to, and I'm just going to have a couple of things. Let's say I do something like this. I, which is one, then 
to, oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so now I have my Roman numerals, right? I have one, two, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five with their independent values. But what if I wanted to iterate through these keys, right? Well, that's where the for of loop comes in. So I can say for uh, numeral, Jesus, numeral of my object. And then I can just console.log the numeral. Now, if I go to clear this and I run this, uh, it seems like I got a an error. Uh, this is my object. Interesting. It's in for objects. Oh, in for objects? Interesting. Let's see. Yeah, there you go. So if I use in, it's going to actually iterate through it, and it's going to give me each one of those actual keys, right? So we got i, 2, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now let's say I do entries. And let's say I do numeral, comma, value. I think that should also work. Looks like that one is wrong. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I may need to review that one a little bit. Let me see what I have here. Ah, interesting. I am doing this wrong. So here it is. I want to establish that this is going to be for an object. And I want the entries of said object. So I'm going to do the name of it. So let's see my object. And for now, let's just do my item. So let's say let item. And I go ahead and console.log that item. Well, when I run it, we can see that I get arrays for each key and value pair, right? I can also do something like uh, key, comma, key, comma, value. And if I do it that way, I can console.log my key. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, I can console.log that key. Notice that I'm basically taking that original array, right? And I'm kind of destructuring it. I'm grabbing those values. I'm saying, hey, for each one of these array, I want a reference of key and a reference of value. I could console.log them individually. So console.log value. Now I have access to both the key and the value corresponding to it, but I have them by their separate by their separate variables. So that's how you could iterate through an array and be able to grab all of those values inside of it. Does anyone have any questions about, sorry, I keep calling this an array. Does anyone have any questions on how you can iterate through an object and the different ways and methods that you can use to iterate through an object? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Of course. So do you have to call it key and value here, or you can just call it whatever you want. You just did that for an example. Oh, you could call it whatever you want. So you could do a uh, numeral and then, um, I don't know, val might be the best. Okay. All right. And it still fun and it still works correctly. These are just variables. So it's whatever you want to call them as far as a reference. Thank you. Of course. Any question. Um, was this uh, an example of a for of 
loop. So this is a for of loop, yes, because it's iterating through a array of arrays. That's what entries delivers to us. Thank you. Of course. And then if you just want the keys, it would be a for in loop. So uh, for numeral in my object. All right, so here we see the for in loop take an action, which is grabbing the keys by numeral. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so that's it as far as objects go. We're all good here. And now we can start talking about a little bit more of our advanced um, advanced topics, such as manipulating an object. Well, we just we pretty much just covered that. Uh, but let's say I wanted to add a new key to my object, right? I have this object of numerals. Well, what if I wanted to add um, something into it? Or if I wanted to identify, you know, what the easiest example would be, uh, you have a set of strings and you want to determine how many times a specific letter is inside of this string, right? So let's say, let my string be equal to, I'm just going to put a bunch of gibberish in there and take out this semicolon that I placed in there. Okay. And then I want to create an empty diction, an empty object. So letters, and this is going to be an empty object. And then all I want to do is I want to create a value inside of this object corresponding to each individual. So each key will be represented by a letter. And then the value of that letter will be how many times that letter is inside of the string, right? When I can do a for let letter, and then I think this one is of my string. And all I would want to do for now, let's just console.log the letters first. Oh, sorry. Okay, so that's working correctly. We can see that it's giving me all the letters inside of that string. And notice that if I change this into an in, it's going to return to me the indexes of that string rather than the values, right? So that's why we're using the of. So now all I need to do is I need to add these letters into the, di into the object and give it a value. Well, I only want that to happen if it doesn't exist. So I'm going to say if letters has the current letter, then I'm going to say letters at the current letter plus or equals one. Otherwise, I'm going to give it a variable of letter and make that equal to one. Okay, and at the end of this for loop, I'm just going to console.log the letters object. Well, now when I run this, we can see the letters object populates and we can see all the different letters that was in that gibberish of a string and it gives me the value of how many times each one of those letters was inside of the string. So we can see that I think A and F were the highest ones, and then we have all of our external letters or external keys being assigned a one. But that's just essentially how it works. I'm asking it, hey, does letters, the object of letters, have this current specific letter as a key? If it does, I want you to add one to its current value. And if it doesn't, I want you to give it one. And that's how we build that object to be able to count each individual letter and how many times it appears within the string. Does anyone have any questions about how that works?
Uh, I have one question, Francisco. Just can you just um go over real quick again inside the for loop the, the difference between of and in? Yeah, definitely. Let me go ahead and comment this out real quick and comment this. Okay, so that for loop right now is currently an of. So if I console.log the variable of letter and I clear this, let me run that real quick. We see that it's giving me each individual actual letter in the string, right? So it gives me each separate one as a as a separate console.log statement. Well, if I change it to in, rather than giving me the value, it's going to give me the index of each one of those. So here we can see that it gives me from zero all the way to 42. So that tells me that this is 43 characters long from index zero to 42. Does that make sense, Robert? Yeah, so you said n will provide the index and of provided the actual each Bound. individual letter. Okay, got it. Perfect. Any other questions? But so didn't you use in for like a dictionary at some point and you got the values, but it didn't you it didn't uh, return an index at that point. That's correct. So I used it for this diction for this object, right? And that's the weird thing about JavaScript. So <laughs> It has different functionality depending on the data type, right? So the data type that we're currently iterating through was a string. And I used an in to get the indices and an of to get the values. Now, in this case, where I'm iterating through an object, an object is not iterable, right? But the keys are iterable. So what I can do is I can say for key of my object, oh, sorry, in my object. And I can console.log that key. Oh, geez. All right, and it's actually giving me the keys inside of it. Well, if I try to use of, it's gonna freak out and it's gonna tell me, hey, I can't do this because this is not an iterable thing. Right, it doesn't have values that I can repeat to you. An object doesn't have it and doesn't have indexes. But when I use the of key, the in keyword, instead of grabbing indexes, it grabs the keys. Does that make sense? Not really, but it's not because of your explanation. It's just because I guess, like you said, JavaScript's kind of just weird or dynamic with that. But okay, thank you. Of course. All right, fantastic. So now let's go on to part two of our lecture today. So just in case you're following along, um, if you go into the 3JS just directory, there's two, which is intermediate JS and jest. This is just gonna talk about arrow functions and it's gonna break down the map and how we can destructure objects and arrays. So let's talk about that real quick. Now let me comment this out and then I'll move back over to functions. Where did you go functions? Here you are. Okay, so now I have this function make a name. And earlier we know that we've established this function by using the word function. Well, this is old syntax, and this is the old way of establishing a function in JavaScript. Now we use something called arrow functions. And arrow functions, all they do is just make it more complicated for you to make a function. Instead, you're going to be utilizing the const variable. You're going to follow that by the name of the function. You're going to throw an equal sign there. And by placing a parentheses here, you're telling this const and variable, that this is going to be a function. So I can give it first and last, All right? And then after that, I'm just gonna simply create an arrow and then open up my curly brackets. Everything else can remain the same, 
I can still return an interpolated string here where I have my first and last. All right, so this is essentially the same thing as the function that you see up above. It's just a different syntax where I'm creating an arrow function. So I'm utilizing the const variable rather than utilizing function. After the make a name, instead of being followed by the parentheses, I have to write an equal sign, give it the parentheses with the parameters that I need. And then before opening up the curly brackets for the body, I have to establish the arrow function. And that's how JavaScript knows that this is still working as a function. So now if I go ahead and uncomment this console.log make a name of John McCoy, I can still run node day js3 and I still get John McCoy because it's still working exactly the same. It's finding the function, make a name. It's grabbing the parameter of John and placing it as first, grabbing the parameter of McCoy, placing it as last, and then returning an interpolated string where first of was John, a space in between them, and then last as McCoy. And that's how we get John McCoy in our terminal. Does anyone have any questions about arrow functions? They're really not different. It's just syntactual sugar. I've got a question. Yeah, of course. Um, so arrow functions, I've, I've found some places where I feel kind of like comfortable using them and then other places where I really don't. How, how important is it to update to this syntax? Um, I think nowadays the most common thing you'll see are arrow functions. It's very rare that you'll see anybody actually use the function keyword um, to write a function in JavaScript. So from now on, moving forward, I strongly recommend that everybody utilizes the arrow function method. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Of course. All right. Any other questions? Do you know why they decided to go with this? That they just want to, like, I don't know, make JavaScript look newer or something? Uh, I think when you make a function with the keyword a function under the hood, it looks like this. Um, so I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is just to... Um, make things faster and efficient but i i i may be wrong in that uh i oh would... i i think i vaguely know what you're talking about yeah like how it's like a function is kind of just a variable in a way where you're assigning right with specific under the hood yeah, yeah. With specific behavior under the hood so this might make it like slightly faster because you're avoiding the function keyword you're just making a variable Right, you're using the under the hood method to create your function rather than the over the hood. Okay, that's actually kind of cool. Yeah. Um, right. Does wasting work the same way with the arrow functions as it does with the function keyword? Sorry, does what work the same way? Hoisting. Hoisting? Yeah, hoisting still works the same way. You can still hoist a function regardless whether it's an arrow function or just a function defined by the keyword. I was under the impression that if you're using the this keyword, it doesn't uh, work the same if you're using an arrow function versus the other method. The this keyword? Yeah. So if you're, say, assigning it within an object, like making a function within an object, and then you want to use like this dot name because you want to grab one of those other variables, that if you're using an arrow function, it automatically goes up to the overall scope versus the object scope. I know what you're, yes. Yeah, so you, what you're talking about is a class method. Um, and that's where this dot something comes into it, right? And where you're utilize, what you're talking about is whether it belongs to the class itself or an instance of the class itself, or if it belongs globally. Um, and yes, you're right. There is a different behavior in that, but I that topic does not, uh, pertain to the lesson of today, but we will cover it once we get into object-oriented programming. But that's a really good observation, Megan. Thanks, guys. Of course. All right. 
Great. So now that we went through that and we we understand the difference between an arrow function and just a function, we can move forward into mapping. So now mapping is not necessarily something that we'll use right now, uh, but it is something that we'll have to use eventually. Um, and what I mean by eventually is I'm talking about Java once we start working with React. So with React, um, you won't really have the ability to use for loops and for in loops as much as you you will with this mapping system. So it's important that you understand how to map. So let's try to add a couple more variables in here. And I'm sorry, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. So I'm just going to use your guys' names. Uh, OK, so now we can see that I made this array a little bit longer. Maybe I should add my name in there as well. And then I'll add Adam's name. Oh, I already have Adam. OK, so now if I wanted to grab each one of these indices or each one of these indexes within this array, I could easily do a for loop. And I could do like a for i loop, or I could do a for in loop uh, to try to grab this um, each one of these indexes. but there's a simpler way to do that where I can just say my array dot map. And in this mapping function, it's going to require an argument. So it's going to say, okay, well, inside of this mapping function, I know that I'm going to be going through each one of these. But what would you like to reference each one of these indexes by? So let's say I just call it um, placer. Then I open up my arrow function. And now inside of this map, well, what is it that you want to do to placer? Well, I want you to console.log placer. All right, so let's see what that looks like now. So now when I run that specific function, all right, because map is a method built into an array, and notice that the method of map takes in an arrow function, right? That's what we're establishing here. We're establishing an arrow function. I'm saying what you're going to call each one of the parameters that are being passed in, which is each place within the array. And I'm going to call it placer. Then I'm making my arrow function and opening up the body. Then I'm telling it what to do with each one of those parameters. And all I want it to do is to console.log that parameter. So here we see names, 85, 35, 89, sorry, false, Joshua, Anthony, Aaron, Adam, and Francisco. That's how the mapping function works. Does anyone have any questions about that? Are you, you're about to, I imagine, get into how to establish the other parameters of the mapping function? How to establish the other parameters within a mapping function. And I'm assuming you're talking about index? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So if I wanted to grab the index that I'm currently located at, I could also place something like IDX in there. And if I look at the map function, if I just hover over it, it's going to tell me the things that it does for me, right? So we see that it's a mapping function. It's something that applies to array. And that array may hold a string, a number, or a Boolean, and it will map through it. And then we see that the function takes in a callback function. And I'm just reading off the very first line, right? And that callback function uh, needs a value, which could be represented as a string, a number, or a Boolean. And that's the placer that we provided to that callback function. And then we see index, and that's going to tell us a number. So that index, I'm just going to simply call it IDX, but it's just going to tell us a number. So let's see. What happens if I do placer, comma, IDX? Well, let's run this script. And now we can see that not only does it give me the value of uh, whatever I'm, whatever index I'm currently on, but it also provides to me the index that corresponds to that value within the array. Does everyone understand how that works? OK, any questions pertaining to the mapping function? So when you use IDX inside of mapping, it always knows IDX's index, right? As opposed to like using IDX in a different function, 
you'd have to like give it a value, right? Yeah, you don't have to call this IDX. You could call it whatever you want. This is a this is just a placeholder. So I could just call this quite literally gibberish, right? And it would still return to me the same value. The reason why it knows that this second argument is referencing to the index is because of the way that the mapping function breaks down. So here, if I hover over okay. map, we could see that in this callback function, right, which is the parentheses that we have inside the pink parentheses that are currently highlighted, um, this callback function on the left side has a value, which in our case is placer, and then it has a comma, and then it has index, which in our case is the gibberish that we just placed in there. And that's how it knows that the second argument will always be representing the index. Does that make sense? Makes sense, thank you. Of course. All right. So let's try to look at, uh, see a way that we could apply this and kind of combine all the things that we've just learned thus far. All right, let's say that we have a series of numbers. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. And let's say that okay. I found this on the web for a series of numbers, 12,345. I apologize to everyone. My computer is trying to take over. <laughs> All right. So we have these numbers. And I only want these numbers to be altered if the index in which they're located is an odd number. Well, let's try to, let's try to make an algorithm that would do that. All right. So I'm going to say... If IDX and let's say modulo two, so that's going to return to me the remainder, if there is a remainder, right? So I'm going to say if it's equal to zero, so that means that zero would be even, two would be even, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to console.log the placer. And then otherwise, I'm going to console.log the placer times two. So now when this iterates through, it's going to grab index zero divided by two, and it's going to have a remainder of zero. So that's going to be uh, zero is equal to zero. This is going to come back as true. It's going to console.log one. When it moves into index one, index one divided by two is 0.5, which is not equal to zero. So we'll knock into our else statement and I'll multiply two by two, giving us four. So now if we clear this and we run our script, we can see that multiplication happening, right? So we have one, two was at index one. So it met our else statement and it multiplied two by two. Then we have three, then four, which was multiplied by two to give us eight, then five, and then six multiplied by two to give us 12. And that's how you could use kind of everything that we've gone over so far to make a quick little algorithm. Does anyone have any questions around the mapping function, how we can utilize it and its benefits? A quick question. Um, yeah. When we pass the, the, um, the parameter in the map function, if we just have one parameter, do we need the the um the the parentheses, or um, is that just if we need both, or is it best practice just to go ahead and put parentheses around if we just have one parameter? I would always put parentheses around it just so that you know you're okay. calling a callback function and that it is an arrow function. If you only have one parameter, you do not need the parentheses, but just for common practice and to make sure that your syntax is always following a specific structure, have those nested parentheses in there. Cool. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I've got one. Where where would you personally really prefer to use this mapping function? Yeah, um, this mapping function, I myself am not a fan of the, uh, the four of or four I loops or anything like that for a race. I much rather just use the mapping function just because it's quicker syntax. It already knows exactly what I'm trying to do. And it gives me all the information that I need, right? I just needed the one individual index that I'm currently on. And then I could just grab, I mean, I need the one individual value that I'm currently on. And I could grab the index where that value is located. 
So I see no benefit to utilizing a for I loop rather than utilizing the map function whenever I'm working with an array. Does that answer your question, Brian? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Of course. All right. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, actually. So um, mapping only goes from zero to the length. It doesn't ever go backwards, right? You can't, if you ever needed to iterate backwards to an array. Right. It doesn't go backwards, but what you can do is reverse the array first and then map. So then okay, that yeah. way going backwards through the array. All right. Okay, perfect. Let's go ahead and move on to our next one. Our next one's going to be um how does it how do we actually use something like the uh like destructuring? How does destructuring work? Right. Well, let's see. I'm gonna comment this out and I'm just gonna come down here and talk about destructuring. Okay, so let's say I have a I have an array. So let array of letters. And I'm just gonna make this array simply just letters. Okay, so I have A, B, C, D. Well, now if I wanted to console.log each one of these letters, let's say I wanted to console.log E, I would just do array of letters and I could do, I think I could do index negative one. Nope, that's gonna give me undefined, of course, why wouldn't it? Well, I could always do array of letters dot length minus one. Okay, and there you go. I'm getting the last letter, right? Which is E and that's great and all. I know that there's a way that I could figure out how to get each one of these letters. Um, but if once, as my array gets more complicated and there's more nested values inside of it, maybe I have keys, maybe I have objects in here that I want to be able to grab. And it can make it a little bit harder to be able to extrapolate data that way by just calling it by indexes. Well, that's where destructuring comes in. I could actually do something like A, B, C, D, and E. And now when I go to console.log E, it's actually going to console.log that very last variable, All right? We can see that the same number of variables are here as the same number of letters within the array. And each one of these variables is connecting to the, um, the value within the array. So same thing if I console.log B, I can still have it. I could actually put B the letter And it would still console.log b. Does anyone have any questions about how this works? It's pretty simple. Um, you know, don't try to overthink it. There's no connection between what you utilize as a variable and what the value is. The only connection is the order. So it's going to go from left to right. And you need to make sure that the same number of variables are provided for the same number of objects that you're trying to destructure. Any questions? Yeah, is that just like a less dynamic way, kind of like hard coding, I guess? Yeah, it's definitely it could be definitely so viewed as something a little bit more of hard coding. Uh, you'll really see the benefit to this whole destructuring method once we're working with React and we're passing in props and all of these other elements within other elements. Um, we just want to make sure that we introduce this concept early on so that it's at least in the back of your head. You may not use it for any of the algorithms. But once we get into, into React, it won't be the first time you see it. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. All right, any other questions? Okay, great. Let's go ahead and take a look at how this would look if we're working with something like an object. All right, we have A, B, and C. 
And then let's go ahead and create an object. So now that object has A, and let's give that 45. It has B, let's give that I don't know, 32. And then it has C. And now let's give that number five. Well, I can also do the same thing. I can console.log and I can console.log B. When I go to console.log that, oh, interesting. Oh, that would make sense. There you go. When I go to console.log B, we can see that it gives me the value of 32. Now, this one, remember when we were working in the array, I told you that the way you named the variables didn't matter. Well, in this case, it does. If I try to do something that doesn't exist within the object, so if I say bravo rather than b, and then I try to console.log bravo, you see that it's going to return to me undefined. That's because it's going to look inside of the object, trying to find a key named bravo to grab that value. But since it doesn't exist, it just tells me, hey, this is undefined. It doesn't exist within this object. So this is where there's an actual connection between the variable and the key that you were looking for. Whereas in arrays, it doesn't matter because it just goes by the order and the indexes. If you're using numbers for keys, will it work the same way? Because I, I, I'm assuming you, you're not supposed to start variables with numbers, correct? Exactly. So let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. Okay, so now we can see that I'm trying to destructure this object. I'm trying to do it by numbers. But it's already telling me, hey, I don't understand what you are trying to do. And even if I wrap it within these um, within these parentheses, oh, sorry, not parentheses, within this quotation marks to try to turn it into a string, it's still freaking out. And it's still telling me, hey, this, this isn't going to work. This is not the way the structuring works. And I can't operate with numbers. Because we can't, just like you mentioned, we can't name a variable starting with a number. Did that answer your question, Megan? Yes, thank you. Of course. There you go. Okay. Great. And that's destructuring. Pretty easy, right? Any questions at all over what we just went over? Francisca, do you have another example that you could that you have on hand for destructuring just to um yeah just, just take to confirm it. it? Yeah, definitely. Let's uh let's grab this database one that we had earlier. Where'd you go? There you go. Okay, so here we have this database as person one. Let's change this for person two. Rather than having person one or person two, all I'm going to do here is I'm going to destructure this object. I'm going to call it person one and person two. So now when I go to console.log, I can just console.log person one. When I run that, we can see that 32 is coming from up here. I apologize, should have commented that out. Um, but we can see that Tom and H34 is being console.logged from person one, right? which I destructured up here. It grabs the key of person one, and it returns to me the value of an object with the name of Tom and the age of 34. Right, and if I wanted to see it, oh, go ahead, Josh. Oh, no, you can continue with this. Oh, okay. 
Uh, so now if I wanted to see it with an array, let's say let uh, A or A, B, C, and let's make that equal to uh, one, two, and three. Well, now if I wanted to see from this array, if I wanted to see the number three, I can console.log C. Right? And all this does is it matches by indexes. So the array will say that index three of what I'm destructuring, which is C, or sorry, index two of what I'm destructuring, which is C, is the same as index two of the array that I'm trying to destructure, which is three. So now the variable of C is equal to three. Did that clear things up, Andrew? Uh, yeah, it uh, that solidified things a little bit more. So thanks. Of course, perfect. Go ahead, Josh. Yes, so for uh, your first example, um, well, that, that lower example, the person one, person two, if that was an array, would that still work when you set the uh, when you set that first variable, the array equal to the object? Okay, so you're saying if this was, got it. So if this was an object, an array of objects, okay. Uh, so. No, if um, if person one, person two, mm -hmm. uh, right after let. If okay. that was an array, does that still work? Oh, if this was an array? Yeah. So no, it wouldn't work. And the reason why it wouldn't work is because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to destructure something by indexes. Interesting. doesn't seem like it's throwing an error. Let me check it out. I may be wrong. Might have spoke too soon. Let's try it out. Okay. Yeah, so it didn't work. Good. <laughs> I was scared. Uh. And the reason why it doesn't work is because when you're trying to destructure something with square brackets, it does it by indexes and not by matching a key a key to whatever variable you're naming here, right? Whereas if you turn this into an object or with curly brackets, it's going to actively look for a key that matches the variable, right? This works because this is working by indexes, meaning that the array is iterable. And this works because it's working by keys, meaning that the value or the variable that I'm passing into it has a matching key within it, right? If I try to turn this into square brackets, I would be trying to tell JavaScript that this object is now iterable, which is not the case, right? Objects are not iterable. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? All right. Awesome. It looks like we have imports and export statements, and then we get into Jest. So let's talk about imports and exports. So we already have our function. We made a function a couple of times named, uh, let me comment all of this out just to make sure that we're not getting any weird console.logs. And now let me look for a function up here. Where did you go? There you go. Okay, so we have this function of make a name. And let's say I want to export it, right? I want to use it in a different file. Well, how can I do that? Well, I would have to do this thing called module.exports. And your JavaScript may not be able to recognize it. Um, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it the function that I want to be able to grab in another file. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and export my make a name function. And now I'm going to create a runner.js. Now I in runner.js, I wanna actually be able to utilize this function. So now all I'm going to do is say const make a name is equal to require. 
and in require, I'm going to simply tell it which file it is that I was supposed to be looking for. So in our case is day three dot JS. So this const make a name is going to go to day three dot JS and it's going to look for something that's being exported. It's going to find the function make a name that's being exported and it's going to match it with this constant variable. All right. So now I can say uh, console dot log make a name and pass in Francisco. Okay, and if I did everything correctly, which I hope it did, I did, I can run runner JS with node and it would still trigger the function Francisco Avila, right? So in the case that I have a function that's like 50 something lines long, or it's just a ridiculous method or function, or there's a lot of logic going on and this file gets super dirty. Like for example, right now we have a file that's 164 lines long. Well, if I just want to grab a specific function out of that file, I could have a separate file that references to those functions. I can export those functions and then bring them into the file that I'm using that's much cleaner to actually be able to use it and output data. Does anyone have any questions around exports and how to use the require method? Yeah, can you uh, show the require method one more time and maybe give one more example, please? Yeah, of course. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. And uh, before I do that, Clarice, can you ask me your question? I may be able to knock out both at once. Um, I guess I'm wondering about the file name. Like it's, is it so supposed to start with dot slash? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I'll, I'll knock both of these out real quick. So let's take a look at day three dot js. Right. I'm gonna go ahead and make another make another function here. Okay, so let's say this function, um, adding twos. This function adding twos takes in a parameter of number and all it's going to do is it's going to return that number plus two. Okay, there's my function. Now I'm going to export that function. So I'm going to say module because it's going to look at this as a module. I'm going to specify the exports that are going to come out of this file. I'm going to make that equal to adding twos. Okay, there it is. Module.exports, adding twos. So now this function of adding twos is being exported. Well, now I want to use that function in my runner. So how can I do that? Well, I'm going to make a, a constant variable in my runner that's going to have the same name. So adding twos. And I want to make sure that this name matches the function that I'm trying to use so that I can grab the correct one. And then I'm going to say require because it doesn't know where it's grabbing this adding twos from, right? It doesn't know where it exists. It doesn't know where to look. Well, now I'm going to specify the path to the file where I want it to look for. I could do something like in this directory, I want you to use day3.js, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm saying within this directory, that's where that period slash is, is saying, I want you to grab day3.js, open it up. So it's going to open up day3.js. It's going to see module.exports, and it's going to find adding twos. And it's basically just going to grab this function and bring it in to the const of adding twos. So now I can console.log adding twos, place an in four in there. And what I should see is six. Now we see six populate. Did that answer your question, Clarice? Uh, yep. Perfect. And then Brian, did that answer your question? It, uh, yes, it did. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. Is there any other questions around exports and imports? How would you export and import multiple functions? Would you just add a comma? Yeah, that's a good question. 
So let's take a look at that, All right? Let's say I also wanted to export make a name and I'm just making sure that it's uncommented. Okay, there's make a name. So let's see. Okay, so now I just added exports. So it tells me const and sport can take in. Okay. And it can take in any. So let's say I want both of these, right? And I'm actually experimenting because I'm not sure how. So let's make sure that this one still works the same. Okay, this one does still work the same. So now let's say I want const um, make a name that equals require day3.js. And let me actually move that down here. Yeah, let's make sure both of them work. Interesting. I wonder why I got a two row. First and last. Hmm. So for some reason, it's doing Francisco 2, even though the second argument I'm passing into it is my name. So there's something going on there as far as syntax goes. Was last another variable that was changed in day three? I think I have the same variable, right? So I have cons, make a name, first and last. You might need to throw some parentheses around the uh, exports when you do the module.exports, like on the bottom. And it throws parentheses around those two. Hmm. Maybe. Let's see. Yep, that did it. But now I'm getting undefined for adding twos. But it is returning. Hmm. Maybe it's the way I'm grabbing it. So let's see. Oh, that definitely wasn't it. Let's try to do some square brackets. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that's working either. Hmm. So there's a way to get two of them. Uh, we just have to figure out what the correct syntax is for getting both of them. Because although this works, it is giving me this really annoying undefined that's kind of driving me nuts a little bit. Um, so I'll have to figure out why it's doing that. But as soon as I get a, solid, a solidified answer, I'll make sure to get back to the class. Um, but currently right now, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and continue pushing forward because we only have 20 minutes left. So the next and last thing we're going to cover is going to be Jest and how to install and actually create a test suite, and be able to run some tests, right? All of our assessments have test suites. And when you go on into the software engineering world, you may work for a company that's very big on testing. So it's important that we understand how test works and how test-driven development actually works here. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. The first thing we're going to cover is how to install Jest. So now we're going to cover installing Jest with NPM. So we already have NPM, right? We could run NPM and it's going to tell me, hey, like you do have NPM, but you need to tell me what it is that you want to do with it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I can run something like NPM in it. And when I run NPM init, it's going to tell me, hey, you know, yeah, you're trying to init something, but I already exist. I'm already initialized. You don't need to do that. I don't know what you're trying to do. So the next thing I'm going to try to do now is I'm going to try to actually install Jess. So I'm going to say NPM install. And when I go to NPM install, I'm going to also save Jest. So I'm going to do dash dash save. I'm going to run Jest. Oh, 
I apologize. It's actually asking me for a, for a name there. So I'm just going to put enter for all these. OK, there you go. So now after I ran npm init, it was able to actually create a whole script for me. So now when I take a look at this package.json, which is the new thing that I have now, we can see that the name for this is running a 3 jest intro as version 1.0. I didn't give it a description. And it doesn't really have anything to do. So let's uh, actually install jest now. So I'm going to run npm install dash dash save jest. So now we can see that jest is installing. We need to give it some time. It may actually tell me that I need to give it some pseudo commands, but hopefully not. OK, so Jest was able to be installed. And now we can see Jest is installed here. And we see that we have this test. And it tells me, hey, this is going to cause an error. I don't know what to do with test. So we're simply just going to change that script to say that whenever I run npm test, it should be running Jest. OK, any questions up to this point? I don't want to continue pushing forward because um, I'm going a little fast. So is there any questions on anything I've covered so far? Yeah, we're you possibly sure. restart. Sorry, could you say that again, Anthony? I was going to say, just can you restart? Can I restart? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that I got thrown an error like kind of early, and it just it was weird. Oh, OK, of course. Yeah, what's up, Clarice? Um, what is this again? Like Jest, I don't understand. Oh, Jest. So Jest is a testing framework that tests JavaScript specifically. And it's very commonly used in the industry. And uh, it's used not only to test out your algorithms, but you're going to use it to test out your actual front end code. OK. Awesome. So let's go ahead. Oh, yeah, what's up, Brian? Where? Where should we install this on our machine? Yeah, that's a good question. So currently right now, um, I don't know where you guys are located, uh, but you would want to install this in the file or within the directory where you're going to be creating your testing file, All right? So I'm currently inside this JS and Python intro folder. So I know that that's where I'm going to be creating my testing file. So this is where I'm installing everything. Does that answer your question, Brian? Um, partially. So like if we have one file that's code platoon, but then maybe other file or uh, one folder code platoon and then others within it, would we want to do it inside the code platoon or inside the specific folder that we're working on? The specific folder that you're working on. You do not want this globally because then it could affect other test suites that you don't want it to affect. So thank you. Of course. All right. So let's restart this. So we have npm, right? We already know what npm is. So now I'm just going to run npm init. Now, when I run npm init, it's going to ask me a couple of questions. So it's going to say, OK, we're going to start an npm package. What would you like the package name to be? If you don't give it one, it's going to take the parent directory and use that as the default. So I'm going to press Enter. Sure, I want you to use version one. I don't want to give it a description. You can if you would like to. And the entry point would be day three JS. Sounds good. The test command doesn't have one. The Git repository doesn't have one. Keywords, nothing, author, license. I don't want any of that. And then after that, it's going to give me a demo of what my package lock JSON is going to be. This is okay. This is what I want it to be. So I'm just going to simply type in Yes. And that's going to create my package.json. Is everyone up to part up up to this point? No, what's up, Frank? Uh I'm trying to follow the steps, but it keeps giving me like an error code. An error code. Interesting. Uh, da -da -da. Okay, we may have to address that specific error code after class. Um, 
So please stick around and then me and you can get together and try to diagnose that. Okay. Okay. So, so now, I've... oh, go ahead. So when you install just into a file, it creates a .json file, correct? No. So this is npm init. After I did npm init, I have this package.json file. I haven't gone into installing Jest just yet. All right. So now all this is doing is creating a node uh, a node environment for me to be to be able to pra to process different files. I don't want to go too much in debt around what package.json is. I want to concentrate around the parts that we need to know because you'll you'll learn a lot more about node and what it's doing in the background once we get to React. So now the next portion is we're going to actually install Jest. So now we're going to go ahead and run npm install dash dash save Jest. And when we run that, we're going to see a couple of other files populate here eventually. OK, so now we see this package log JSON. This is the one that gets created whenever I go ahead and install Jest. And this is just for Jest purposes. Now it knows that it has it, and it could run utilizing those guidance. Um, but here on line 11, we can see that now we have dependencies. So it's saying that this node module or this specific dic uh, directory that I'm currently in cannot run unless it has these dependencies using NPM. So now for the script of test, I'm going to switch it so that it runs Jest. All right, and this is telling it that now when I run NPM test, it's going to open up Jest, right? And we saw that it opens up Jest here. And then it tells me, hey, I couldn't find any tests. So it throws out this weird error. It's saying, hey, I couldn't find any tests. There's no test suites for me to look at. Um, I don't know what you want me to do. So I'm just going to tell you there are no test suites and I couldn't find any. So you ran me for no reason. Does anyone have any questions up to this point? OK. and. From the looks of it and how much time we have and how much we still have to cover, we're going to have to continue this class after lunch. Um, so currently right now it's 1019. Uh, those people who have errors, please let me know about your errors. And other than that, we'll go ahead and pick up class today after lunch. Currently right now for lunch, let me go ahead and check the calendar one more time just to make sure I'm giving everyone the appropriate times. Uh, we're going to be ending lunch at 1.30, so please everyone be back by 1.30 so that we can continue on the lecture. And immediately after finishing the lecture, we'll knock into Adam's um, beha um, behavioral te or technical lesson. So thank you so much, everyone. If you don't have a question or you don't have an error so far, uh, you are free to go to lunch. Otherwise, let's go ahead and address those questions and errors. All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's go ahead and finish off this Jest tutorial. Um, so right before we left, we finished installing Jest with NPM. We saw that we populated this node modules, um, as well as populating this package dash lock JSON, which we don't really need to go into, um, and the package.json, which is something that we actually should and need to understand. Um, so know that the name is referencing to the parent directory. The version is just which version node it is you're using. Description is whatever description you want to give it. Its main is utilizing the 3JS, and it knows that the scripts that we're currently giving it is test. So when I run npm test, it's actually going to trigger the Jest module that I just installed, which is also a dependency in my package lock JSON. So now let's actually go into creating our test, right? That's the whole point why we did this. So let's go into creating a little bit of a test here. So in order to create a test, first we have to go over naming conventions for a test file. So now that we're utilizing Jest, let's create a test file. So let's do touch and let's say um, adding.test.js. Okay, 
And now we can see this adding.test.js has been created. And notice that it's red, right? Well, it's red because it knows that this is supposed to be a testing module. It knows that this is going to be tested. And the way it knows it's going to be tested is because it has .test.js. So anytime you create a test file, know that it will always have .test inside of the test files. Does anyone have any questions around naming conventions for test files? Okay, fantastic. Let's move on into actually creating our test. So we already had this uh, runner.js where we kind of grabbed all of the things that we needed to grab from our day three. So let's go to day three and let's just grab adding two. All right, we're just gonna grab adding twos and that's the only thing that's gonna be exported. And let me go inside my runner. Everything's commented out. Great. The only thing I'm exporting is adding twos. So now here for just, I can just say const adding twos is equal to require. And in this require, I'm just gonna say day three dot JS. Okay. And just like that, the adding twos function has been imported into my test file. Now, why would I wanna test this behavior? What's the purpose of testing? Why is this even a thing? And why do we need to know it? Well, tests essentially are a way for us to make sure that our program is working the way it's supposed to be working. And a lot of developers don't like tests because their argument is, well, now when I develop code, not only do I have to write the code, but afterwards I have to write a test for that code. And if anything changes in the development process and I notice that I need to change what this function is returning, well, now I need to go back and change the test. And yes, that is true. It's a, it's a little annoying part of what happens when you're doing test-driven development. But at the same time, test-driven development allows, allows you to develop new features without and giving you the assurance that you didn't break something in a prior step or in another feature that may be connected to it. And it essentially saves you time and money because now, let's say I want to refactor something rather than running console.log over and over again and running the script over and over again. Or once we get into the development process, uh, having to refresh the page or create a new user at X, Y, and Z. Now all I need to do is run my test suite. And when I run my test suite, I can see immediately whether everything came back yeah, as passed or if something broke. So let's write a really simple test first. And let's go into the different things that we can utilize to write a test. So the first thing that we're going to utilize here is going to be describe. And I don't think we need this, so I'm going to comment that out. Okay. So describe is a function um, that quite literally describes what we're about to test out. So writing a simple addition test. Okay. And then within this describe, we'll have to open up a body. Now, testing can be also used as a living version of documentation, right? And the way that it's utilized as a living version of documentation is by the, by the comments that you're adding to this describe log. This describe log should describe where the test is happening and what it is testing. Well, this the describe log should describe where the test is happening. And then the test block should describe what it is testing. So testing, adding twos to ensure it works properly. Okay, and finally, we make another arrow function. Okay, so now it's going to describe something and then test something. Well, let's take a look at what happens when I run my test suite so far. And to run my test suite, I'm just gonna run npm test. So would you look at that? It was able to identify a test. So adding te adding.test.js. It went into my description block, which is writing a simple addition test. And then it says testing adding twos to ensure it works properly. Notice that it passed, but I'm not actually testing anything inside of this test block, all right? But because of the fact that I'm not testing anything inside of the test block, it's passing. It doesn't have a failing condition. So it just assumes it's supposed to pass. So now I actually need to give it a condition. I need to, to, I need to tell it what to expect and what it should be. So very easily, I can say, I want you to expect, oh, hello. I want you to expect that adding twos with four is going to be 
six. All right, so I'm telling it, hey, I want you to expect this function of adding twos with the parameter of four to return the value of six. And if I take a look at day three JS, if I were to pass in four, four plus two is equal to six. So that's what it should return. So now let's see what happens when I run my test suite now. Okay, so it still passes. Now, I wonder what happens if I give it a failing condition of four and I run it. Well, now it tells me something failed. And let's take a look at this output of what failed. So it tells me, look, I was expecting this to be four, but according to the code that you wrote, I received six from that function. And it tells me very explicitly where it failed. So in less than two milliseconds, it was able to run my code and identify at which step it failed. So it failed inside of my test block saying test adding twos and expected it to be four and it received six. And here it tells me exactly where in the test block the mistake was risen. And that's just in case my test is wrong and not my actual code. Okay, so now I know this is working, that this isn't working correctly, but that's because I made a mistake in my test. If I turn it into six and I run it, well, now it should work. Okay, does anyone have any questions about that? What were you calling to actually run it? NPM test. So NPM is going to reference the package lock JSON. And once it looks into the package lock JSON, it's going to look at the scripts section. So when I run test, it makes the jest testing library be triggered. And that's what actually opens up and runs this test suite. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Uh, when I put test, um, it wanted to autofill to something else. Sorry, um, if you're muting yourself, uh, could you give it a split second so that I can finish hearing what you're saying? Because it seems like you muted yourself too soon. No. Sorry. So um, under describe, when I wrote test um, to write everything else in, in that, yes. Uh, the test wanted to autofill into something else. Right, yeah. So um, sometimes your editor may not be able to identify that you're within a test suite. So when you write tests, it thinks you're writing plain JavaScript and it tries to populate something that relates to JavaScript rather than relating to a test suite. And that's the reason why it tries to auto uh, autofill. If it does that, just press the escape key. And then with the escape key, it will undo the auto. Copy. Perfect. All right. So Oh, go ahead. Can you briefly just run through all these parentheticals that you have in after describe? So from lines four to eight, there's a lot of parentheses and arrow keys going on. Yeah, definitely. Let's go ahead and write another test so that we can take a look at it. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and write a describe block. And this describe block is going to simply say, hey, what is it that I'm that I'm doing? All right. So I'm going to say, hey, I want you to test. Um, if two plus two is four, so, or checking a name function. Okay, so now this describe block needs to take in a function within it, a callback function. So that's why I'm making another arrow function here. All right, so the describe block takes in a callback function and now I have this describe block. Great, now I'm actually gonna write my test. So now my test is a, a separate function that also takes in another callback function. So now test, um, make a name function with two parameters. Okay, and now it's gonna take in my callback function. Now within this test block, and the biggest difference between the test block and the describe block is that inside of the test block, that's where you can actually put your logic. Inside of your describe block, all there should be is a series of test blocks. All right. So now here inside of this test function, well, I can create a function. So I could say const make a name. I can make that equal to a function that will take in first and last. This function is an arrow function. And what it's going to do is it's going to return a function named first 
and last. Okay, so now I made my function and now I can expect, make a name, Francisco Avila. And what I can expect that is to be Francisco Avila as its return value. All right, and that's how I make my tests. So the describe block is strictly just to describe what I'm about to do. It takes in a callback function, which is the reason why we need this parentheses as an arrow function. Then the test block is specifically to describe what the test is doing. And it also takes in a callback function, which we see here. And then inside of that test block, that's where we can actually write some code, which in this case, we're creating a make a name function which is supposed to make a full name when it takes in two parameters. And then we can run the expect block by calling the make a name function with two parameters and checking that it's returning the correct value. Well, now when I run this test, we should identify two separate tests that identified one test suite and that identified two separate tests, which both passed. Does anyone have a question about how this testing works? Can you just put the, uh, <clears throat> like in the chat, can you just write the command that you gave to the test just so I can see it in, in writing? And then I'm good and I appreciate it. Of course. Can you call multiple expects in the same test or do you need to do them in a new one each time? Uh, you need to create a new test block each time. Each test block will only run the first expect. If you could write multiples, but it's only going to check the very first one. And then Matt, I believe you had a question as well. Uh, yeah, so really, I guess, where does this fall in when it comes to like actual projects? Because I guess what my brain's looking at is um, that test that you did, I guess you just fix it now. I didn't see you change it, but um, oh yeah, right down there. So it's like, if you're on a team, do you kind of set up test cases like almost as a way to kind of measure how you guys are like progressing on the project or is it something like you, you do it as you go? If that makes sense. Yeah. So what you're referencing to is how the workflow works, right? So let's take a look at that actually. And that's exactly what I was about to go into. And we have just the perfect amount of time. So now let's say I want to I want to create a function, right? And uh, this function does fizzbus. Let's just say that. And let's say that this function is going to run, and then once it returns that object, it's what's uh, what I'm going to display to the user, right? So I'm going to write a describe block. Um, in this describe block, I can see that it's trying to bring something in again. In describe block, I'm going to say um, fizzbus being tested. I'm going to open up my arrow function. I'm going to test uh, fizzbuzz up to 30. And then I'm going to say uh, const or expect. Oh, hello. Expect fizzbuzz. And then I'm going to put 30 in there. And then to be. And I guess fizzbuzz wasn't necessarily the correct uh, function because I would have returned something pretty complicated to, to kind of test the one thing for. Uh, maybe we should just say greeting, right? Let's go with something simpler. Greeting uh, with name, sure. And I want this to be, um, hello, Francisco. Okay, so that's how it would work, right? I want a behavior to specifically happen. So the very first thing I do is I write the test, 
for that behavior. All right, none of this functionality this functionality exists just yet, um, but I'm creating the test for it because in my mind I envisioned what I want this function to look like or what I what it is that I wanted to do. So after that, I would run my test suite. And after I run my test suite, it would tell me that it would found a test suite and that test suite failed. And I expect it to fail because it's going to tell me greeting with name is not defined. It doesn't know where to find this. It doesn't exist. And it's true. It does not exist. So now let's just go to runner.js and then I would create the function. So const and I would create greeting with name that would take in a parameter, which would be name. And then that would return an interpolated string saying, hello, name with an exclamation point. All right. So now I run this again. Okay, well, it's still not able to realize what it's doing. So let's just do this. Let's return null. And now it's not able to know what it's doing because I haven't exported. So let's do module.exports and make that equal to reading with name. Now I can go back to adding test and grab that function. Okay, so now if I run this, I should still see it fail, but it should fail in a separate spot. So now we see that it's not failing because it doesn't know where greeting with name is coming from. It's failing because its expected value was hello Francisco and it received null. Okay, great. So now I know my function is connected properly. My, my test suite is able to actually run the test. So now all I need to do is fix my return value. So now I would just say, hello, comma, Francisco. Oh, actually, that should be dynamic. So I apologize. This would be name. Okay. And then finally, I just went from red light to orange light and to green light. And that's the process. You want to go red light, orange light, green light. So complete fail. Test doesn't, the test fails because the function doesn't exist. Then orange because the test, the function does exist, but it's not returning the correct value. And then green light, which means I finally achieved it. And then at this point, I would be good to continue developing onto the next test. And that's the way it works. You develop the test depending on the information that you want to provide for yourself. And then after you have the test, you construct a function. Does that make sense, Matt? Okay, perfect. Does anyone have any questions about testing? Can you do like, um, instead of like expect and to be, like do one where you expect it to not be? Uh, I know when we were doing the Python unit testing for the FOP, they had a um, not one. I think there is. Let me check it. Okay. So here's all the different ones and here's the Jest documentation. I'm pretty sure it's attached to the bottom of our curriculum, um, but it tells us the different things that we could want it to be, right? So we can expect it to be, uh, to have been canceled. There's a couple of complicated ones. There's even a length that you could expect on there. But let me see if there's a to not. Um... Oh, here we go, dot not, dot to be. Okay, perfect. So dot not, dot to be. Okay, let's see what that does. Okay, so here we go. So it got expected received, dot not to be expected. So the object is equal and it's throwing an error because it's it's working properly, it's equal, right? So if I take off the O there and I, oh yeah, I take it off and I run it, 
Well, now it passes because obviously it would only return Francisc and not Francisco. Does that answer your question, Megan? Perfectly, thank you. Of course. All right. And that is all the material that we had for today. So in overview, today we went over, oh, Jesus. Okay, so today we went over what is the internet, how does JS work with the internet and what its function is, the tools of Node, variables, let versus const functions, the different data types that are available and how to iterate through them. We went over loops, manipulating an object, arrow functions versus functions. We went over the mapping function for arrays. We went over how to destructure object entries, import and export statements, and how you and how to utilize the Jest library. Um, at this point, I am more than confident in everyone's ability to go ahead and implement all the concepts that were taught today and pass their algorithms for today's homework with flying colors. Does anyone have any closing remarks or any questions for me before we close the class? Do you have something, Anthony, or is that just, nope, you're just playing with your hoodie. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Let me go ahead and stop recording.